Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by the collecting legend, Mike Corrado. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks. I appreciate it. Sure. Yeah. It's, um, I, you and I met uh, at the Chicago Drum Show uh, in 2019, which I guess is the last one that, um, you know, that happened when we're recording this because it's 2020 and the world has gone crazy. And right. uh, I'll never yeah. forget. You give me you gave me your your business card, which was actually a tuning key that had your name and information engraved on it, which will always be the coolest thing, <laughs> the coolest card I've ever gotten. <laughs> cool. Good. Yeah. So, Mike, you are just uh, lo- you are one of those people who's just kind of a name like the Corrado Collection. You're synonymous with um, really some of the finest drums in the world. I would love to hear about your collection. Um, you've been recommended by multiple people, too many to name, um, as being a guest on this show, like almost one of those like essential uh, guests, um, especially on, on the drum forums. I see your name pop up all the time as, hey, you should get him on the show. So you're here. I'm excited. Why don't we start by really going back to how did how did Mike Corrado become, you know, the legendary uh, drum collector? How did it all start? Well, um, I've been playing drums for 61 years. I've been teaching drums for 57 years. And through all my years of playing, I always had some, you know, five or 10 snare drums laying around. Um, uh, Just, you know, different sounds. I really wasn't into the vintage or collectability of them. I just had them laying around and I would use them for different gigs. And then... um, Around 1994, 95, I started reading some articles about vintage drums and uh, engraved drums and black beauties. And then and then I, I started seeing that some of the drums that were presented or some of the drums I had in, in my, you know, my stash of drums. So then about March of 95, I brought in two snare drums to um, a guy named Sam Adato in San Francisco. He had a drum shop. He now moved up and up to the West Coast, I think in Oregon. And uh, we made a trade. Yeah, I tra- yeah, he traded me a nice 7x14 twin strainer white marine pearl swing model and WFL. And I traded him an old grit snare and something else. And the bug bit from there. I, uh, <laughs> that was the first of my starting of my collecting. That was probably around M- March of 1995. Wow. Yeah, man. And before we move forward, just so people know, um, how many snares do you have now? Um, give or take 650 <laughs> could be as l- as little as 650. 40, it could be 660, but we're, we're, you know, let's say 640 to 650 plus or minus. Oh man. Okay. Just to put that into perspective. So everyone, everyone uh, knows and okay. So, um, and what year, remind me again, you just said it, but what year was that, that you started that you would say the bug bit, you started the collection. The March of 1995. 95. Okay. So it's been going on for a long time now. Um, obviously you are a drummer. Um, we've spoken on the phone a few times before this and you're a drum teacher, correct? You teach many students. Yeah. Now, um, gosh, I just, it's like jaw dropping 600, Uh let's call it 650 snares. That's unbelievable. (laughs) Yeah. I'd love to hear a little bit about, um, so it's not like a thing though, where, and maybe you're going to change this where I know you have a book, um, this isn't something though where like they're very uh, on they're on, not on display like as far as I know you can't really click through and see every single snare that you have so that it, it really is a a private collection at this point correct it is except when you walk in the entryway to my house uh, you'll see a couple of hundred snare drums on custom shelves and we don't use a dining room in my house so that dining room has about 50 snare drums in it along with my Peloton bike and all that. Um, so a lot of, a lot of the A material is on display. Um, and I, I 
I have friends that come by and see the collection or fellow collectors if they're in town, they, you know, they come by and see it. So, and then in the garage, I have uh, some cabinets that I have a couple of hundred snare drums in that um, snare drums with the rare finishes like peacock pearl and rose pearl that shouldn't see the light of day continually. So they're in dark, yeah. nice dark cabinets, but they're, you know, available to show people. And, uh, then I have some drums in storage, you know, just like some old duplexes or kind of collectibles, but you know, just old stuff or, you know, the, um, nickel over brass snare drums, um, yeah. that are, that are, that are, should be in a collection, but then it's not the A material. Yeah. Your like D material is probably nicer than my, <laughs> you know, <laughs> A material. It's, Unbelievable. So, and I got to ask, you are married, correct? Yes. I've been married uh, 31 years. Uh, my wife okay. puts up with it. Uh, she's actually <laughs> Everyone's kind of legendary. Wondering that. She's, she's kind of legendary amongst collectors. For if, you, um, if you look up an old drum magazine, they, they had an article about me with that you'll see pan shots of my entryway that they, they showed the photos. And you'll get an idea of how the setup is at the house. And but my wife uh, is definitely legendary amongst collectors. Uh, you know, she puts up with my craziness. I, I pay mm. for it in other ways, as <laughs> other collectors will probably know. But uh, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it works out so far. Man, yeah. I mean, I have a. Um an old Japanese kit in my kind of front hall, right when you open the door. And I thought I was like living uh -huh. the dream. <laughs> Your next level, man. Wow. That's unbelievable. So I think it'd be kind of cool. I want to do a couple things. I want to hear about sure. some of your favorite snares, how you collect these, but maybe you can tell someone, um, I don't know if it's even tangible, but like, what's, let's say like, like, all right. So me, I want to maybe get into collecting snare drums. What is a good first thing I should do? How do I get into collecting valuable, rare snares? Well, uh, a lot of things are swimming in my mind, but I'll just kind of not, not in really any order. Sure. Uh, I found I found over the years having a good network of friends mm -hmm. and fellow collectors has really helped. But the the price paid for that is those fellow friends and collectors that I've done deals with. If you do honest deals and come through with your end of the deal, these guys are going to want to do business with you again. Yeah. So yeah. So I have a, a, a nice network of friends um, and collectors that if they find something that maybe they're not interested in, they'll, they'll alert me as I will for them. You know, I'm not into sure. um, 60s Gretsch drum sets, although they're great and I totally respect what they are. I just don't collect them. But if I see things like that, I'll call my good friend, Steve Maxwell. He, he deals in that kind of stuff. And vice versa, he'll, he'll alert me a, a black beauty that's available or, or something. So again, just to answer your question, if you get that nice, um, you know, list of friends that, um, contacts, uh, then you're, you're getting calls here and there, even if it doesn't pan out, I always appreciate the call. And a lot of times if it doesn't work for me, I can turn them on to someone else that might be interested. Yeah. So that's one, that's one way to start getting a collection. Um, you know, the drum shows are always, always help. Uh, yeah. eBay, I, I've found a lot of great snare drums on eBay. I mean, a lot over the that's years. Interesting to me. Cause I'm 30 and I feel like eBay was huge and maybe it kind of went more to like in, in so I'm wrong, obviously, but it went more to like, Facebook marketplace, Craigslist, um, eBay's risky because it's, you know, it's being shipped and there's a lot of fake stuff on eBay, but you're, you're telling me that like, no, eBay is where it's at. There's lots of good stuff on eBay, um, to this day, right? Yeah. I found, I found, I mean, I found some great drums. 
some of them I've paid up the wazoo for, and some of them I've gotten for a steal. Um, they're out there. Uh, you know, the thing with eBay, eBay's very pro buyer. So, yeah. you know, if you, if you get something and it's not right, I mean, you know, you can file a claim and, you know, it's kind of unfortunate, but the, the seller gets docked right away. And, uh, oh, that's good to know. Yeah. But aside from all the, that stuff, the, just, you know, a good straight deal where you see a cool drum, you put your bid in. Uh, I like to snipe it. I'm a kind of a sniper. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I actually found a lot of drums. I mean, some, explain what s- sniping means while we're, while we're uh, on that. Um, well, it's, um, you wait till the last couple of seconds and then you throw your bid in. In the old days of, of eBay, you, you had to kind of have a, a, I have a little atomic clock next to me there. So I, I got the accurate time. Nowadays, yeah. you, eBay has a thing where you're bidding and it shows a little time clock next to it. How many seconds, how many minutes left. So, wow. you know, there's other ways too. It, there's another concept is you just throw in your bid and just your bid is the most you want to pay. And if it ends up sure. being the winning, winning bid, then you're the winner. If it doesn't, you then, you know, you, you don't win. Or the other thing they have is the buy it now. If you really want it, I, I've, I've gotten things like that because I really wanted it. Just buy it now. You pay a little more premium, but, you know, you knock everything out of the way and you get it. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, have you ever been burned by anything like that well you said ebay really covers it but like maybe you like has it happened to you where you're trying to you know you bid on something and you get it and it's not even what you wanted or it's broken or it's a fake has that happened to you um no fakes although you know with 650 snare drums you know i'm sure something might have slipped by but sure. pretty much the the person i people i people i have dealt with you know, have been honest. Um, I've gotten uh, burned lightly. You know, a drum will come and, and the badge is loose and it looks like it's been taken off and put on. Or yeah. I, I, I bought something off uh, Shop Goodwill once, which they're good people and they took care yeah. of business. But they, you know, they, they said the drum was six and a half by 15 and it was actually six and a half by 14. Well, that's nice. But that's not what they said. I wanted it. Yeah. I wanted it. But it was a very rare um, black jewel model. So I took it anyway. But then they knocked 500 bucks off. And, they, you know, they tried to tell me, well, you know, we have a certain way to measure. And I go, well, no. You measure from the inside of the drum, and that's the <laughs> diameter. Have a nice day. Yeah. You know, don't tell me about that, you know. So they were cool, though. They, they refunded me some money. And so yeah. I, have, I have nothing but good things to say. They took care of business. A couple other things I've gotten, you know, some surprises, a couple of extra holes that nobody decided to tell me about. Uh, in most sure. cases, everybody has taken care of business. Uh, one collector back east kind of just said, well, too bad. You should have known. I said, well, you know, my clairvoyance license expired last month, and I didn't know that. So, <laughs> yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. So, but I okay. think... I would think what you just said about, oh, this guy kind of did something shady goes back to the first one of your network of friends where then you can then say, hey, everyone, watch out for this guy or girl because they have burned me. And then your reputation is super. It's got to be super important, you know, sure. to keeping a good, clean. Cause you have a yeah. great reputation, obviously. Um, yeah, it's a small yeah. group of people. So. You know, you start doing that to too many people, you, you just your name will get out there. But th- these are few and far between. You know, 90, yeah, 95, 98% of the time, it's a good deal. Maybe something minor here and there. Maybe the, the, the collector was like an antique dealer and really didn't know a lot about drums. So, you know, he said, the, you know, the drum was seven inches, but it's six and a half because he measured all the way out to the rims instead of the shell. Yeah. My, my, you know, Minor little things, you know, uh, you can let that slide. And, honest. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, honest mistake. And, and everybody, most everybody has taken care of business. And uh, so I still give, on the eBay, I still give it an A, you know. Um, okay. 
yeah, I, you know, it's, I've had pleasurable experiences. I've been doing eBay since 1998, buying and wow. selling, you know, you know, like I'll buy, I'll buy some drums and clean them up and make the money off that. And then just save the money to spend on the drums I really want. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I got to get back on eBay. Um, yeah. now, so, um, you said buying and selling, do you sell a lot of drums? Cause it sounds like with 650, you know, ish snares you have, are you, are they, are they mainly coming in and not going out or are they going out to help support the, uh, the habit? <laughs> right. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much what they call an end user. The, the yeah. stuff I collect is I keep, like I might find, if I, let's say I find a black beauty that I just can get for cheap, clean it up and make some money on it. I'll do that. If I don't have sure. it already like it. Uh, so I'll buy, you know, or, or something, something comes in the store where I teach and they don't want it. They'll turn me onto it. I'll take it home, clean it up and put it on eBay and, you know, hopefully make some money on it. So primarily I, I collect and I keep the drums. The, you know, yeah. if I, I put a lot of effort into finding some drums, so I, I don't worry about, you know, what it's going to be worth next year. If I wanted it right now, I want it for the collection and I enjoy it for what it is now. I, I tell people my collection, these drums could be worth a nickel tomorrow. I can still honestly say that I had fun collecting them. So mm -hmm. that's, that's where I'm at. I don't do it as a, as a, for a living that that's great sure. it's, and it's harder because I know a lot of the guys that collect and they're also dealers, you know, what do you, you know, what do you, you got to buy something for a thousand bucks and you got to turn it or you're sitting on merchandise where if I buy yeah. it, I want it for the collection. So it kind of makes it a little easier on the brain there. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I find that like, like if I do, uh, let's say an episode or something on social media where, you know, a video that I'll put up of Buddy Rich will get a ton of views and it's great. But then one that I do of like some very cool thing that I am really like, I had to dig to find um, and I put it up and it gets a couple likes. I'm like, well, I'm still happy that I found that and surfaced it and showed it to people Yeah, exactly. because it's important. You know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. um, it doesn't matter that, that stuff. So, um, yeah. I remember talking to John Aldridge um, oh, yeah. about collecting. Obviously, you guys know each other. You've done this. But like, I think he said something about once you kind of get your first, let's say, Black Beauty, it seems like almost collecting like classic cars or something like you can then take that and then trade it for something else. And then like once you get one, you're sort of in the yeah. Like, yeah. That money is invested and it's going to keep you can make it go up and up and up and up. It's just an initial buy in. That's, I guess, kind of the hurdle. Yeah. Uh, John Aldridge, is a, is, I consider him a great friend. Um, he was one of the first collectors I met in my early days. He took a lot of time with me to answer my novice questions. Uh, yeah. And I hold him responsible for getting me into black beauties. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, but, but to answer your question, yeah, see, Sometimes I'll find a drum and I already have one or two of, so you can fix it up, clean it, make some money. But I, I tend to collect, I like to collect sets of things. So I like to collect a four by 14 version, a five by 14, a six and a half. And then in the six lug in the eight lug and the 10 lug. So yeah. I like, I like sets of things. That's very cool. And I know, um, like I think Mark Cooper talked about it on the show of yeah. like collecting Slingerland, a matching banjo to a matching snare or drum set from obviously yeah. very early on in Slingerland. It's you know that yeah. same kind of like uh, yeah. Mark has set. Mark has I think I've seen he has a, a a sea green banjo and I think a rose banjo and and uh, those match up with the sea green and the uh, uh, rose pearl Slingerland. Yeah. So yeah, I've seen those. Absolutely. Now, yeah. are you only snares, or do you have some? Obviously, you you have a drum set. I I would imagine, but do you are or do you collect drum sets as well? No. If I if I started collecting drum sets, I'd have to come and live with you because <laughs> I'm I'm already pushing the the limit here. I do have a yeah. couple of drum sets. You know, I have one packed up, and then I have a couple at the drum studio where I teach. Yeah. Uh, but I, I primarily I my main thing is I collect vintage snare drums 
Also, just a side thing to that, I collect, you know, old drum keys and old sticks and old drum pads and catalogs and things like that. But cool. drum-wise, I collect just snare drums. Yeah, that makes sense. You're right. Yeah. Drum sets are, obviously you can stack them, but they're very, um, uh, they take up a lot of space. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. now, um, I, I love getting your, um, I'm on getting your email list you you oh, send cool. out to people who, who are on there you get your um uh you know you send out and they're they're in i should say in not so modern drummer you yeah. document your finds and your hunts and and, yeah, and you yeah. know and what you've done to these snares um so i just think what you're doing is just kind of like a um like how people can follow along with your journey is super cool um I would love to hear a little bit about maybe let's say top five or, you know, whatever top three of kind of the Holy grail. You can't believe that you got it. <laughs> snare drums. Yeah. yeah. What would those be? Well, that's a, that's a rough one because it's hard. I'll, I'll, I'll try to limit it. It's, there's, there's so many that are, that are in that. There's so many that are in the top five. If I, if I can yeah. say it that way. Um, Top hundred, <laughs> right? There you go. That's better. Um, yeah. Well, uh, a, a snare drum that I really like um, from the twenties is called the uh, Gold Engraved Triumphal Model. Um, I've uh, kind of studied a little bit, and uh, I, to my uh, kind of uh, checking out who owns what, and and my searching, I've narrowed it down that there's 10 of them so far uh, out there. And I kind of know where they all are. Uh, so I like to collect triumphals. Um, I've never heard of that. I'm Googling it now, obviously. So okay. it's Ludwig. Yeah, it's Ludwig. Um, it, it's a gold. It's a gold plated. Everything's gold plated. The shell is engraved. The uh, lugs are engraved and the rims are engraved. It was kind of like oh. Ludwig Ludwig's flagship snare drum. Hmm. So, so um, I collect. So I collect triumphals. I like those are my top snare drums. Hmm. I'm not many around. There's only ten of them out there, so uh, not a whole lot that I know of. You know, there could be more. And you know, Uncle Elmer's born in Oklahoma, but but right yeah. now I've 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 found where where ten of them are. And six of them are in my collection, so I know where the where the rest are. Well, before you move on to number two here, let me ask you, and this is probably, you know, a no one can answer this kind of question, but if there's, whatever, you said 10 of these snares in the world. Um, so far. So far, okay. But yeah, so that's my question is like, Ludwig made a bunch of them. No one knows what happens to them, but like, that's so interesting to me that like, obviously Ludwig made more than <laughs> 10 snares. They must just get... I mean, obviously, again, no one knows, but they must just get lost to like floods or they're in a barn or they're, that's just such an interesting thing of like, where are these snares? Where did they go? You know, yeah. that must drive you nuts. The, the last one, I, the last triumphal I bought, this lady, um, it was in a pile of garbage in the house that they sold, that they bought. The guy oh left God. the house and left it, it was on top of the garbage can. This is a, you know a rare, so the rare drum and the guy's just going to throw it away. So, um, that's wow. what happens sometimes. So uh, these drums were 125 bucks or so back in the early twenties. So that was big money then. So it's safe to say that they didn't make many of them. Um, you know, yeah, uh, I've been told by <clears throat> Harry Kangany, a noted collector, an historian, yep. he thinks they made about 12 of them. That was his opinion. Um, Whoa. and that so far, you know, makes sense. Cause I will, I've only come up where there's 10 of them again, not that there's any more somewhere else, but they just haven't surfaced. Jeez. Yeah, man. And, and yeah, I look online and it says some of them were made in 1928, which obviously the following year was the great depression. So that is a sure. killer on, you know, yeah, the uh, luxurious snare. Yeah, the twenty five is the the models with the eight lugs or ten lugs, and then ten lugs. Uh, there's a couple of the supers, and uh, obviously those were out in the late twenties also. 
Yeah. So, and then I got a, uh, I got a couple of six lug triumphals. So early ones. And so, so people know, cause it's kind of, I Googled triumphant. It's triumphal T R I U M P H A L. Is yeah. What triumphal. Yeah. Search you'll, see it in, you'll see it in the old Ludwig catalogs. They up in the front, they'll show the different options. You can get, uh, the deluxe hardware, which is the copper with the gold lacquer or chrome, if it's after 1929, or nickel. And then they'll have, um, they'll, they'll mention gold. They might even mention triumphal, where everything's gold plated and engraved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. There's, um, there's one on eBay that I see for thirteen thousand five hundred dollars. So I might uh, I might snipe that. <laughs> All right. No, I'm kidding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My God, no, I would be uh, in trouble. But okay, so um, what? Yeah, what's number two on your list? Well, I have a Gladstone. I have a oh. original Gladstone. It's it's in my book. Um, it's the Charlie Cordes model. Charlie Cordes was, um. Billy Gladstone's mechanic, the guy who put everything together. Oh, wow. And it's a uh, gold. It's a six by 14 gold lacquer with all gold hardware. Um, and from what I'm told, it's the only one like that. The one that mm. same finish, but it is a seven by 14 is Billy's actual drum. A good friend of mine owns that. Wow. But from what I'm told, there's only, he only made two, of the gold lacquer shell with gold hardware. And, uh, so Man. that's, that's a very rare one. Um, yeah, I want to do, um, I, I've Dom Famularo did a, um, episode about, um, Moeller, Gladstone and stone, oh, yeah. which was kind of you know, touching on all of them a little bit. Yeah. I think I need to do a Billy Gladstone episode because his snares are just some of the most, him as a person obviously is, is, you know, a legend, but his snares are, very rare and very, um, you know, iconic. And there's just, uh, it's just so cool. So that's, God, that's gotta be, um, how well, did you come across uh, that? Was that an eBay thing or how did you get that one? That one was actually one of my first big purchases, probably around 1996. Uh, I heard a guy had a, had five or six Gladstones in, a uh, uh, Florida. And so we talked and worked a deal, but before I forget, you ought to look up, um, Chet Falzerano, he's a very well-known Gladstone expert, and he'd be a great interview for you. Oh, he's, uh, yeah. yeah, he's the, you know, he has a book out about Gladstone, and he owns six or seven original Gladstones and Gretz Gladstones, so he'd be the perfect person to talk to that stuff. Also, oh, Steve, yeah, Maxwell, Steve, Steve Maxwell, Steve Maxwell, Maxwell Drums, he's brokered a lot of Gladstone, so he can tell you a lot about that, too. Perfect. Yeah. Steve's on my list. Uh, oh, I'll good, publicly good. say that I've, I'm tr I've been trying to get Steve on the show and he's, uh, <coughs> it just hasn't worked yet. Cause I, I want to do a, um, Craviato episode as well, which oh, is, yeah, Craviato. I think yeah. everyone knows I've said it on the show a bunch. These episodes, sometimes they take forever. You, for example, we met in 2019. We talked via the email for maybe a year and it just kind of, yeah. they just don't happen and it's no one's fault. It's not a bad thing, but when they actually do, it's just, it's awesome. So, um, oh, yeah, pr I appreciate the recommendation. So, sure. okay. So you got the Ludwig, you got the Gladstone. What else is your, uh, you know, your, your, your house is on fire. You grab these right. snares. Oh boy. <laughs> I'd probably leave them all because I couldn't, I couldn't take the ones I want. I'd be, it'd yeah. be, that'd be a, I'd be a, uh, I'd hate to be in that boat. But another oh, one yeah. I like, I'm a, I like uh Slingerland do all models. They're kind of yeah. cool. Um, they're, uh, the same concept as the sling, as the uh, Ludwig super Ludwig model parallel mechanism on the bottom. Um, but they're much rarer because they got sued by Ludwig because their mechanism was too close to Ludwig's and they went to court and Ludwig won. So they had to cease and desist. So there's not many, uh, Slingerland do alls out there, uh, hmm. of the do alls, the one that, I really think is a holy grail is it's a, uh, it's a black engraved do all called the radio model. Uh, it's the only one I've ever seen again, not that there's another one somewhere, but at the moment, sure. this is the only one I've ever seen. 
this one a friend of mine alerted me to and the guy that had it sent me pictures and I looked at the shell and it was covered in in white lacquer or enamel and he started God. to yeah he started to take the enamel off and I I said wait well, just hold on for a second and I could notice engraving engraving underneath so we struck a deal and I just said just send me the drum here's your money and I was able to get the white lacquer off he found it in an art school in a room in an art school somewhere and um, so I was able to get the white lacquer off and it was a, the same engraving that's on a slinger on black beauty, but it's called a radio model, which is the metal version uh, of a dual with the art gold hardware. So yeah. that was, a, that was wow. the fun restoration. I'm looking at it. There's a, um, uh, not so modern drummer, uh, article about it that you wrote. Which is really yeah. cool to be like talking about this and looking it up and oh my oh, god, cool. that all right, like we rehearsed it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Cue the pictures. So, yeah. um, do you do? Do you physically do all these restorations yourself? Like, do you go out and have a workbench? You do everything. You strip it. You're the master of getting these, you know, unbelievably rare snares um, back to life. Or, or do you get some help on certain things? Um, both. Like I have a, okay. you know, I have my garage where I have all my things that I do when I restore, I try to, um, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of three ways to go. You can leave the drum as it is, or you can do some kind of, you know, restoration, or you can totally make it brand new looking. I kind of keep in the middle. Um, yeah. so, so I'm not a purist, but, uh, I'm realistic. There's an old saying I use that a friend of mine told me, uh, rust doesn't sleep. So you can leave the drum like it is if you want to be a purist, but that rust is going to keep on going. So I yeah. get rid of the rust, clean up the hard, you know, hardware. If it's, if it's nickel over brass, you know, polish it up. If it's really, you know, sometimes nickel gets that patina that you just can't uh, polish out by hand. So I'll bring it to my platers and they got the big polishing wheels and they don't replate it. They just polish it up. It's called coloring. They just bring the, the nickel back to life. Or sure. if it's art, go, art the art gold or deluxe finish from Ludwig, where the copper is blackened, it's because the lacquer is worn off and then the copper just, you know, tarnishes. So I'll, I'll get all that old lacquer off and polish up the original copper and then hit it with some gold lacquer. So I leave all the imperfections in it. So... Yeah. Uh, so it's just clean, you know, like you, you, if you got an old car and you, you know, the, the headlight rims are rusted, you fix that, you know, it's yeah, just, exactly. So that's, I kind of, you know, I, I don't usually replace anything unless you have to absolutely have to replace something like, let's say, uh, you know, a collar hook is wrong. I don't have a copper one. So I'll get one of the era that's nickel and have it copper to match. Um, yeah. So, and then the, then the shell, a lot of times on those old black beauties, the, the lacquer just gets pitted and really ugly looking. A lot of times I can polish up the original lacquer and it looks really good and go from there. But sometimes it's, it's, it's just so, you know, pitted and, and, uh, thrashed that I can just strip the lacquer off, get it mm -hmm. down to the original black nickel, polish that, and then just re really clear coat it. So at least I had to add a step but it looks way better than it did. So, so it's like taking yeah. an old model T and, and polishing the black, the original black paint, you know, without, yeah. without having to repaint the shell or yeah. repaint. And the, then sealing it, like you're saying, just to keep it from yeah. happening again. Yeah. So I do, uh, I do restorations on the side. I, people send me their drums. It's a good plug for me here. People uh, <laughs> send, send me their drums and I restore them. Um, I've done a bunch of them and, uh, you know, I, I treat their drums like they're mine. So, you know, uh, we discuss it before. I say, here's, here's the parts you're missing. Here's the parts that are broke. Here's what I can do. I can give them, I give them both scenarios, you know, and, uh, if there's a couple of scenarios, which way to go and I'll leave it up yeah. to them. And then, you know, so, oh yeah, to answer your original question. So I'm plating or high end polishing where I can't do it by hand. I'll, I'll go to my platers. They, they take care of me. 
Um, Got it, yeah. Dents, I can usually get dents out of the shell okay. If it's a major dent, I'll go to uh, my plater because they're, they're good at taking dents out. And I also have a machinist, which is down the street from the platers. He'll, he can fix broken strainers, and he's, he's amazing. He brings these old parts back to life. So I, I, I use him a lot for parts that are just thrash or bent or have to be re, you know, rethreaded because they're stripped. He has saved yeah. a lot of, a lot of parts. So it makes the restoration keeps the parts original. They're just fixed. Yeah. 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 You can't have every skill or tool or no, you, you need like a machine shop is a machine shop. I mean, that's what exactly. you do. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Unbelievable. Well, I mean, yeah. I, again, if people have snares or drums that are, you know, I can't think of a better person, obviously, who has more experience with these super rare snares. So um, we'll have all of Mike's info in the description. And at the end, cool. we'll give out where they can reach you. So, um, yeah. All right. Well, maybe a couple more. What, what, that's yeah. three. Give us maybe two more. What else? What else you got? Oh, let's see. We got dual. Let's see. Uh, well, okay, I got a couple of um, um, a Black Beauty that was owned by William F. Ludwig Sr. Wow. Documented, uh, notarized by his son, William F. II, when, you know, 1999. And uh, so I had bought that a while back. Um, and then I also have a snare room that William F. II owned it would say another black beauty it's called the dfs drum the black beauty it's a black beauty where someone on the on the uh, assembly line i guess got in cahoots with the uh, engraver and had his initials in it and the story wow. goes that that william f senior kind of saw what was going on stopped the whole assembly and took the drum off the line but he let the guy keep it or buy it and it was in a guy's closet for many, many years. And then he gave it to William S. Ludwig II. And then uh, Terry Kangan, he bought it a while back. And a, year, a couple of years ago, sold it to me. So that's hmm. kind of, you know, like a, a rare drum. It's a six and a half Definitely. by 14, uh, uh, 10 point floral chrome hardware uh, engraved, super sensitive top and bottom mechanisms. So, wow. yeah. Oh, so, awesome. so those, those are, you know, kind of historic drums. Yeah, um, I love the, um, I feel like with a lot of drums, there's like the, uh, like, Oh, the parts from this are like, um, like I think, um, Ron Danette posted a picture of like, um, a supraphonic that had like the black and white, uh, kind of eighties Ludwig, badge and he's like this is a supra it's just got the wrong badge on it like i sure. really like the uh, yeah. the rare yeah. kind of like you know you hear about snarling yeah. grabbing a you know they were just grabbing parts <laughs> kind of thing. yeah right the ludwig did that too in the anniversary years they the white enamel badge but you still get some anniversary models that have the leftover um bra um, brass oval badge so you yeah. get those or or you know more modern day you see uh Ludwig drums with WFL butt plates because of that switch over in the what, 1960 or so, whatever that was, just leftover yeah. parts. Yeah, definitely. It's yeah. so cool. It's just like a, we are all nerds. Obviously people listening to this show, we're all pretty much big giant drum nerds. So that, oh, that's definitely. just more fun. of <laughs> just like, oh my God, that screw is from 1950 yep. on a 1960 drum. It's like, whoa, cool. <laughs> Geek, geek. Geekatron minutia, I call it. <laughs> yeah, and there's plenty of us in the world. Oh, yeah. In my experience of, I mean, before I did this show, I was a drummer. I mean, I was, you know, I've been a long time drummer, but I wasn't into the vintage drum world. And now I'm like, yeah, made I've made so many friends. Uh, obviously, these guys who are your great friends, but it's just like, I just encourage people as a guy who, me, who's you know, at the point that point I was 28. I didn't really have any vintage drum experience. And now I find myself just obsessed with it where it's so easy to get into it. And going to the Chicago show was like the best yeah. thing I've ever done in my life. Um, oh, yeah. besides getting married I, and having a baby, yeah. but it, um, right. <laughs> I have to say that, but it getting that network, if you're, yep. if you're God, if you're, uh, 
you know, passionate about it, people will want to talk to you about it and we, we want to share our nerdiness. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's a, it's a great network. Uh, you know, I, I have a, I've met a lot of friends and fellow collectors and, uh, uh, the Chicago show. I look, I, I look forward to that so much. I, I hope, Me too. I hope, I hope the, you know, the, the, the brainiacs out there in science, come up with a vaccine that works and we can kind of get on the road here and hope by next May we can be in better shape to be able to, yeah. not only for the people that are sick, that, that comes first, obviously, but I, obviously for the, yeah, for the, uh, but second is the, us going to a drum show. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. No, that's awesome. Um, all right. So, um, I want to also just mention Jim Messina has been such a big, um, yeah. he always, he's, he's, he's shares your stuff a lot. And I've just, Jim is a, I, I, we, we've, we were talking a lot there for a little and then, and then things got crazy with COVID and everything. So, um, yeah. I just want to say, you know, Jim is such a big, you know, proponent of yours and sharing your information and, um, with vintage drums talk. So, um, so many cool collectors. I just think that you guys are, it's a, it's like the you know, the, the legends of collecting. Um, so now why don't we tell people here where they can find your book and all that good stuff? I think it would be, um, pretty neat to, you know, for people to see your collection and, and what, you know, what's going okay. on in the future sure. with you. Well, you, first of all, you can see all the latest stuff I do, uh, not so modern drummer. It's free online. Go there and you'll look under the writers. You'll see my name. Um, also, uh, um, you know, the two drum, the two drum forums that I participate drum forum DFO, that would be, and then the other one is vintage drums. Um, so I, I, I contribute a lot to those. Um, now as far as my book, um, it's out of print, but you can find copies on eBay and you can find copies on Amazon. And maybe Reverb, I haven't checked, but I've seen, I've seen, I think I've seen some copies there. So it can be found that way. Um, yeah. I'm not sure mm. if any dealers still have leftover copies. It's probably unlikely. Uh, but the two main ways is eBay <clears throat> and uh, Amazon. Okay. Called That's the cool. uh, uh, Vintage Snare Drums, the Corrado Collection. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I don't know if you ever think about it, but I know people would love to see it. You got to start like a, you know, a social media page for Instagram and just post a picture of a snare every day. You've got, if you do that, you have years of content. Um, uh, well, without... actually, since you mentioned that, thanks you. Uh, I have uh, on Facebook, I have my Corrado vintage drums and restorations. So you can there see you a go. bunch of stuff there. Yeah, so it's Mike Ferrado, Vintage Drums and Restorations. I'm on Facebook. Cool. Yeah. Man, that's so cool. Now, what's on the horizon for you? Are you now happy? Can you go to sleep at night saying, I've got every drum that I ever want to have? I know the answer is no. <laughs> so, yeah, all right. What are you working on now? What, what's kind of um, in, in, your, in your scope right now? Well, um, uh the collecting at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm looking always for the rarest of the rare because I have a lot of rare already. Uh, yeah. so I'm looking at what I consider the rarest of the rare. Um, so it's a little fewer and far between. So, um, just, sure. you know, looking at eBay here and there, friends call me. Um, uh, I'm always looking for, a four by 14 Slayerland black beauty, which I've never seen one. It's in the catalog, uh -huh. but I've never seen one. So I'd like to get something like that. Yeah. And, uh, does that happen? Can I ask you, does that happen yeah. where maybe they make something that they put in the catalog or they prototype something, but it actually doesn't exist in the real world? Like does it, could that happen? Um, yeah, I'm, 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 you know, Probably that could happen. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. Um, I would hope that if they put it in the catalog, at least one of them was out there. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, for the picture. Yeah, yeah. or like the the Slinger one, the in the twenty eight catalog where they have the gold plated engraved artist model. I've never seen any of those. Hmm. I've, you, you can get, you can see the uh, four, five, and six and a half uh, ten lug nickel over brass are artist models, which is the same exact shell. It's just not engraved or gold plated. So who knows how many are, you know, again, the 1920, you know, in the early twenties money was scarce and, you know, to spend 125 or so for a gold plated drum, you know, that was probably half a house. So yeah, seriously, you know, like a car. So. I mean, it's, it's, that conversion rate that that because you see that sometimes where these snares that were, were that amount of money and and it's kind of yeah. like a a, a head scratcher because it's like but these are for a musician who you know by default we're not the most we're not making millions of dollars hundreds of thousands right. of dollars playing the drums so how are you yeah. buying it um yeah so okay yeah. that's interesting um yeah all right and just rare, you know, I'm looking just for, for rare drums, maybe oddities, you know, that, uh, just, you know, like a while back, I found a six lug white Marine Pearl radio King. Um, oh, wow. But, yeah. So th- just kind of odd. I like the audit oddity stuff, mostly American. I have found a couple of European drums that were cool that, uh, that I bought because they're, they're odd. And, uh, so I'm yeah. so, to answer your question, I'm kind of just looking, you know, for the, the rarest of the rare, wherever the, wherever those may be. Yeah, gotcha. I just did the quick math. 120, or I didn't do the math. I did. A, I Googled it. $125 yeah. in 1923 equals $1,878 in 2020. So. Okay. Holy cow. Well, that's, that's yeah, that's actually. The. the that's yeah, a lot of money. The, 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 yeah, the money conversion. But as far as what the drum is go, they go for it's another story. Oh my god! So, I mean, no, oh. of course that's that's just saying yeah. in that day and time. Yeah. Where again, this is like you know people were making I don't know, but like five dollars in a day or something like that. Yeah, really. So it's I know. Um, yeah, that's wild. Okay, so um, now uh, can people see? Do do you display at the drum shows, or do you more just go looking to buy? Um, do you show bring anything with you ever? I can't remember. I don't think I saw you, you know, displaying anything. No, I, I, sometimes I'll bring uh, uh, you know photos, some photos. Um, sure. For a while, I, I brought like you know before I started doing articles on Nazi Modern Drummer, I brought a bunch of photos in a binder. Um, uh, but I just. Uh, I'm I'm going there just to find stuff, to schmooze and yeah. find stuff. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Now this is probably a totally random question, but okay. I, I'm assuming that you have to have like all of your drums. I, I would assume are insured, so you have you can't have 650 drums and not have you know insurance for your drums, right? Do you just is that some sort of special thing? It's probably a weird question. No, no. It's I have homeowners that that's pumped up a little bit because of the drums. Um, and, uh, yeah, so they, you know, you know, a a catastrophe is a catastrophe, but other than, you know, like a fire or or something like that, I have, I have, I have coverage. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm somewhat taken care of. I live out, I live out in the San Francisco Bay area. So it is earthquake country, but, it's not tornado country, <laughs> no. you know, if I, I could, I hate to, you know, be in Oklahoma and have 650 drums flying in the air to the next <laughs> County or something. That would be a drag. Yeah. So, no, you, you don't want that. Right. No. Cool. Yeah. Cause there's all those yeah. little things that you don't think of, of like, I mean, there's like you said, building custom cases and protecting these things. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I imagine temperature control is obviously very important um, for, for some of these moisture, you know, so not, not so much moisture. I have air conditioning. So the, um, you can, it's cool. Cause when it, if it gets warm and then, uh, you put the air conditioner, you can hear the, 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 the cat heads adjusting, you hear little pops and cracks. Yeah. And, uh, so in the, in the garage, like I said, the drums are covered 
it gets a little warm out there, but they're in a garage and they're, you know, once in a while, a bottom calf head will split just because of the elements, but, um, sure. but pretty much here. And I, I don't live, I live maybe 12 miles from the ocean. So there's not a whole lot of sea breeze coming in. Yeah. So really? uh, wow. So not, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it's, that's um, interesting. yeah, it's, it, you know, the, the, the weather out here in the San Francisco Bay area, uh, it's pretty mild. Yeah. Now I'm just like, as we wrap up, I'm just throwing random questions to come to my okay. mind, I, mind at I'm you. Now, do, do you replace calf skin heads? Do you get new, ca- like if it's, if it's got broken heads and it's a 1935 drum, are you replacing top and bottom calf skin heads or are you kind of converting to, you know, a modern, you know, my uh, drum head? I, I put calf heads on all my vintage drums. I put calf heads. This is another thing with having a nice network of friends. Like when I go to the Chicago show, one, one Chicago show, a friend of mine had 15 calf heads that he brought because he knew I'd want to buy them. So nice. yeah. I, I have a, I have a stash of, of, uh, hundreds of calf heads that I pick from <laughs> kind of funny. It's my downstairs. We have an area that has my wife's wine. And then I have my area where my calf heads are. So she's picking out a bottle of wine and I'm picking out a calf head to put on a drum. <laughs> so it's kind of oh, ironic. Man. Yeah. That's so, so I have funny. a, I have a, a, I have a lot of calf heads that I, I, I like to, on my vintage drums, I like to keep them as authentic as, as I can with calf heads, gut snares, wire round snares, original parts, uh, on my modern day snare drums that I play. Obviously, they're they're built they're uh, used you know with some with you know modern day heads and, and snares and things like that. But on the yeah. on the show piece on the show pieces, I like to keep them original. Of course, sure. God, that's yeah. it. Would just take you out of it to have a um, you know nineteen twenty three drum with a uh, you know brand new Remo ambassador. <laughs> on it or something like that. Well, if you're gonna if you're gonna play it, I have no. But if you're gonna I play have, it, sure. Yeah, 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 sure. I'm gonna play it. Put some put some pure sounds or some good you know whatever snare wires that you want. Mm-hmm. I know Canopus is, makes some good uh, uh, snare wires. Uh, pure sound I use some good some good top and bottom heads. Um, uh, some sometimes on those old strainers, you got to replace the strainers. So. Uh, what I do, Ludwig makes a P80 and the tabs on it do not match the whole pattern for an old nickel over brass snare drum that would have a P338 on it. But a friend of mine has a jig that he made that can split, you know, push out the tabs. So on a, on, let's say you want to make a player drum or, or a drum that maybe has an extra hole or two and it's you're just going to make it a player. You can keep the original hole pattern for the for the uh, strainer and put in the altered P80. That'll be a little more hardier anyway because some of those P80s come undone when you hit them really hard. Sure. So like that, you know, you just you, you know on certain drums, you, if you're going to play them, you, you you have to put the good heads on them because I don't yeah. I, I don't like the sound of calf at all, but it's, I like the originality of it. Yeah, I've seen some. Um... God, who is it? I think it's Indie Drums, I-N-D-E. They do something where there's the movable, like on their um, strainer, there's the movable, uh, uh, what would you call it, um, holes to for the, for the you know, screws where it would actually be, you can move it and slide it to fit your your vintage drum. Oh, yeah. It's kind of a cool, a yeah, cool that's idea. A good, I'm sure yeah. other people have I've seen that, that too. I think, I think uh, Ron Danette does that too. I think, I think so too. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a great idea. So you don't, you know, you don't put extra holes because maybe you have an old snare drum that just the strainer is not working right, but you want to keep it, you want to still keep the integrity of it, put that new strainer on it, kind of hot rod it and go play it. And you know, yeah. they, you know, after a while or something, you want to sell it or something, put the original strainer back on and everything's good. Hmm. Jeez. Well, we yeah. live in a great time to, uh, to be collecting drums. Oh uh, Yeah. So, um, man, Mike, I think this has been a really great episode to just kind of hear about your collection. I mean, you're obviously a legend in this world. So, um, I think that people should 
uh, take some time and check out CorradoDrums.com. That's C-U-R-O-T-T-O Drums.com. You can find Mike on Facebook at Mike Corrado Vintage Drums and Restorations. Um, and uh, you're a super nice guy, so I'm sure you wouldn't mind people saying, hey, I've got this old drum. Can you work on it no. for me? Um, I was going to say, yeah. um, is it kosher to give out my email? Oh, of course. Whatever you want. Okay. You, yeah, that's whatever you best, want. That's, for, that's the best one. Uh, it's Mike at CorradoDrums.com. Great. And, you know, if, if anybody has questions or, 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 or people looking to sell something, you know, hey, uh, I buy drums. Um, questions. I, I do that because in the early days when I started collecting, there were certain people I called and they took their time with me to answer my questions. So I don't mind paying that forward to totally if I can. And, and again, I'm, I'm honest enough. Hey, if I don't know, I'll, I'll put you in contact with the right person that knows. That's I, people ask me, Hey, do you know what drum this is all the time? And I go, no, but let me ask. And now I'll, I'll conclude you yeah. on that, but I'll say, let me ask. And I ask, you know, Joe Meckler yeah. or I ask Mark Cooper. Yeah. Go, let oh, me ask Mechler. these guys. I got to um, put a word in. I got, I got to put a word in for Joe. Can I yeah. do that for a sec? Oh, um, please. Of course. Um, uh, two Chicago shows ago, ago, he had, a. Uh, I bought this drum from him. It, it, you, you may have seen it on, in the, not so modern drummer. It was a six and a half by 14 Rose Pearl dual. Very rare. Yeah. Uh, I, I saw the photos of it. I, I, first thing I thought was this is, this is a part strum. This thing was thrashed, absolutely <laughs> thrashed. And he took it and he brought it back to life all faithfully. He was able to fix the wrap, fix the, the glue ring, the hardware just needed cleaning up, but he did, an amazing job, um, just amazing job. If you if you if you look up that drum on either the forum or not so modern drummer, there's a whole story about it, and um, that was a monumental restoration. So I just thought I'd put a plug in for Joe. Oh yeah, no Joe, he comes up on a lot of episodes. He uh, he was the second. He's on episode number two, and right now, oh cool. At the time of recording, this episode sixty nine just came out, so that's uh, wow. You know, two years later, he was he was actually the first person I talked to on the phone uh, when I started the podcast about hey, I'm, I have this idea. He did a World War Two episode, um, so yeah, you know, shout out to Joe. But uh, yeah, awesome, Mike. Well, I can't tell you how happy I am to have had you on the show. It's been a long time coming, and um, everyone can go and check out Mike. So, Mike, thank you for being here. My pleasure. Anytime. I'm always here. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast. <laughs>